I'd started smoking when I was very young. I was probably what you'd call a problem child. I, uh, I, I always felt sorry for my parents when I realised how much of a pain in the ass I was as a kid. Um, I started smoking at probably 12 or 13 and by the time I was <coughs> in my mid to late 20s I was smoking two to three packets of cigarettes a day. I was smoking 60 cigarettes a day. Many people may have heard of the Ironman, a gruelling endurance triathlon comprised of a 3.9 km swim, a 180 km bike ride and a marathon. And then 60 weeks in A&E <laughs> with oxygen. <laughs> That's intense. That's crazy. I would never be able to do that. I'd probably quit after like the swim, maybe half of the swim. That sounds like a lot of work. If someone could do that and complete that, doesn't matter how long it takes them, if they could complete that, it's More good. power to you. I'd be in a hula hoop. Not only did Dublin man Rob Cummins complete an Ironman race, he completed several. Eventually, he gained qualification to represent Ireland at the World Ironman Championships, an annual event of the most elite Iron men and women in the world taking place in Kona, Hawaii. In the space of 11 years, Rob went from a 60 a day smoker in his late 20s to being one of the most elite endurance athletes in the world. When you're a smoker, that's all you can be. They're not something you can do together. You can't be a smoker and a drinker and go and do an Ironman. Maybe some people do, but you know, you can't do both of them and enjoy them. They don't, they're not compatible. So when you're a smoker, that's all you are. That's certainly all I felt I was. So I was trapped like that. I couldn't run, I couldn't cycle, I couldn't do any sports. I couldn't be healthy. I was tired all the time. I was sick all the time. I was constantly getting infections and, and it's, it, I hated it. I tried giving up for years and I'd last days or weeks. I even got off them for a couple of months sometimes, but I never lasted more than that. Eventually, in 1999, at the age of 27, Rob managed to kick the habit, and this time, it was sticking. He had opened a local bike shop a year previous, and after a while gave in to the repeated suggestions of a mechanic working there, who happened to be an accomplished mountain biker, to join him on the trails of the Wicklow Mountains one weekend. Cummins, having never done any sport in his life before this, struggled going up the hills. And I said it to him, I said, listen, I've had enough of this, this is crap, you know, I'm going home, I, I can't do this. And he said, we'll just go a bit further and there's an entrance into the, the trail just up the, the, the way. And he said, we'll go down that way. It's more fun than just going back down the fire road. And we get to the bottom and I immediately say, let's go do that again. It was just the most fun I'd ever had. Like even the physical exertion of getting down the hill half killed me, but I wanted it again. After spending a couple of years mountain biking, Cummins eventually got into road biking, where he spent another couple of years at that. I loved the, the buzz that I got from the mountain biking, but the, the beauty of the road bike was you, you could walk out your front door and you were there. And then in 2003, uh, a friend of mine, a uh, South African guy who was living here at the time, he, he'd been at me for, for months to, to do a triathlon. And I eventually relented and gave in and went and did that one with him. It was the Dublin City Triathlon. So I did the, the swim breaststroke. I was, I think, second last out of the water. I was in reasonable shape from doing a bit of bike racing and I had a good bike and I moved up. I think I got off the bike inside of, maybe inside of the top 10. So I moved from like 140 towards to, I don't know, maybe 10th or 8th or 9th or something like that. And then as soon as I got off and started running, everybody just ran straight back past me again. So I hadn't got a clue about pacing and I was a dreadful runner and a dreadful swimmer. But the big difference for me, when I finished that race, I think I was too, two hours 50, maybe 250 something, which would have put me middle of the pack or back, back middle of the pack. And uh, there was still a lot of people standing around at the finish line cheering you and waiting for you. Whereas I'd done a bike race uh, probably two or three months before and I wasn't, I probably wasn't quite fit enough for the racing that I'd, I'd entered. And I got dropped about six or seven k from the end so you're talking less than 10 minutes from the finish of the race and i got dropped out of the main bunch and rode in on my own i'd say less than 10 minutes afterwards and everyone's gone home including the guy that had my bag with me house keys and my phone in it and i suppose there's always a 
an enjoyment when you're taking something that you're really crap at doing and you, you see improvements. So I went from being not able to swim to being able to swim to being able to swim slightly faster and the same with the running. I was a dreadful runner and gradually got quicker, you know. So once you're seeing those improvements, I think there's a huge motivation to stay in it. Yeah, I suppose my first experience of Ironman was when I was still a smoker and drinker and I came down one morning with a, a pretty bad hangover and sat in front of the television with a cigarette and was flicking through the sports and it, it, the Ironman, the Hawaii Ironman was on I think Eurosport or something like that. This would have been probably close to 20 years ago. I, I couldn't even imagine sitting on a bike and pedalling for two or three hours, never mind a race that took 10 hours. So far, Cummins has qualified for the Kona Ironman World Championships twice, and after getting back surgery in 2013, he's attempting this year to qualify for a third time. Quite the achievement for a former 60-a-day smoker. Training's going pretty well at the moment. I uh, had a, a big day yesterday. It's sort of like a, I suppose, a, an Ironman simulation day. I had a 4K swim in the morning. Uh, 160k on the bike and then ran 13k off that um, that was yesterday and then this morning was a lie-in got up at uh, half seven I, I snuck in and had a, a double espresso in, in the coffee shop here just beside beside wheelworks and uh, went out then and started the intervals and the interval session was five by 15 minutes hard off five minutes easy so I finished up with about 33k today and 13 last night so it's like over a marathon over 12 hours and felt pretty good after it went home had a shower snooze for 30 minutes and, and, and then worked then from two to nine today so uh, yeah no well I, I sort of feel okay and that's I think that's a, a good sign if I'm able to get through those eight nine hour training days and train hard the next day and keep on working without coming in and looking like a cabbage or feeling like a cabbage now that I'm in, in decent shape. I spent probably 18 months or two years looking at the Ironman stuff before I committed to going and doing it. I went and did my first Ironman in France in 2008 and I think I finished 950th or something. So I was nowhere. I was, you know, way, way, way down the back. There was maybe 1,200 people racing, so it was in the last quarter of the field. I wasn't even mid-pack. And I sort of assumed there's always going to be a learning curve with your first race, but when you finish just barely breaking the top 1,000, you don't really think that on your second race you're going to move into the top 50. So I never thought that, excuse me, that I, I could get that fast. I'd be out on my long rides and I'd be daydreaming about it and thinking about how I could do it. and. I, I trained really hard for my next Ironman in Switzerland in 2009, what I thought was hard training. Um, I increased everything that I'd done in France and I went out and I moved up about 30 places. I might have just barely, I don't think I even broke into the 800s, I was still 900 and something. And that very much convinced me, listen, this is where you are, you're a slow person at Ironman, you're a moderately slow person at shorter course, that's just who you are, you're not going to be anything else. When I'd been looking at Ironman, one of the things that they talk about for Ironman that happens is you have this epiphany, you know, it's a real life-changing thing to do. So I crossed the finish line and sort of stood there, I started blacking out, but on my way down to the ground, I remember thinking, where's this epiphany everyone's been telling me about? And I was lying in the medical tent for an hour, waiting for the epiphany, and it didn't arrive, you know, and it's like, fuck that shit, you know? Nobody told me nothing was gonna happen. They all said, you're gonna be a different person. And I wasn't, I wasn't changed, and I was sort of a bit annoyed about it, you know? And about a week later, I was getting the itch to get back training again, and I realized that's what it is. That's what's changed. I'm not the person I was before I started training. The change didn't happen on the day. The change happened in the six months leading up to the race. I became an athlete. And as long as you keep doing Ironman, I think it doesn't matter who we are, whether we're coming in in 14 hours or 10 hours. We all have that dream that we'd love to do Kona. I remember he suggested it, and I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. So why not, like, you know? Um, 
I, I really thought there was a fast athlete in there, fast mm. over a long distance, you know, because at the time he was probably kind of fast over a short distance, but I didn't really think it suited him, you know? Like he'd do a short race and then be fried for three or four days, but I kind of thought if he slowed everything down and put the work in that way, because he definitely had the head for um, doing the work. He's always been really motivated and he will always do you know, the, the sessions he's told to do, even if sometimes he doesn't too fast or whatever. He, um, so once he said he wanted to go for it, I thought, yeah, why not? Ash would have had a, it, there was two things, like there's no bullshit with her, you know, she's not gonna just say, oh yeah, that's a great idea, you know, to make me feel better, you know, because that's not gonna work out very well when I don't qualify or I don't come anywhere near it. So there's no messing with her, you know, if she thinks something's possible, she'll say it. If, she, if it isn't, she'll say that as well. Rob went to a former pro Ironman he knew, who was now coaching, and presented his idea of qualifying for Kona to him. And of course, once Asha told me that, yeah, you know, you, I think you can do this, I, I sort of assumed that everybody else would think the same thing as well. And he looked at me and went, forget about it. It's like, you're not going to Kona. You know, he'd seen me racing locally, so, you know, he knew the level I was at. And he says, you're not going to Kona. I thought about it for about 10 seconds and, and just came back to him with, well, do you know how to coach somebody to get them to Kona. He goes, yeah, of course I do. And I says, okay, well, give me that plan then. So, it, like, that coach had a two-year plan probably in mind for Rob, but Rob said, no, I want to do it now. I want to try now. Yeah. I mean, see how close the dart hits the board, you know? This was in March 2010. Rob then signed up for Ironman UK, which was due to take place in August, giving him five months to get fast enough to finish in the top seven places in his age group. He finished eighth. And as disappointed as I was to not get it, that was hugely outweighed with actually realising that, believing that I was now a Kona athlete. It didn't matter that I hadn't qualified. I was only two minutes away. It was a 10 hour race. It didn't matter. I'd gone way faster than I ever believed I could. Even though I was looking at the numbers and knew what I had to do, it, the, the, that belief was never inside me. And then after that race, I felt like a Kona person. The following year, he attempted it again. Again, he finished eighth, but this time, one of the athletes ahead of him didn't take the qualifying spot, and so it rolled down. Twelve years after giving up his smoking habit, Rob had earned a spot at the start line of one of the most gruelling races in the world. Yeah, uh, Kona's the craziest place on the whole planet. Like, it's just, it's the most bizarre, weirdest place you've ever been. Um, like, it's... The race itself is over 2,000 athletes and they pretty much all qualified to be there. So it's 2,000 of the fittest people you've ever seen. Like if you, you know, if you go to a, a big marathon or something like that where you've got a couple of thousand people in a race, you've got all, all sorts and you've got a couple of fast people at the front and then you've got club runners and then you've got, you know, everything from first timers to 70 year olds doing it maybe. When you go to Kona, the 70 year olds are fitter than us. But it's like, it's 40 degrees all day long and it's, I don't know, 95% humidity. So the conditions are unbelievably difficult to race in. Uh, you, you can't overheat. If you overheat, it's game over. Like it's, it, it, it really is, it's the end of your day. If you overheat, you're at the side of the road vomiting. It was an interesting progression when you looked at it that there was no talent there at all other than the ability to just keep on training for an awful long time. So I often say to people who are interested in the Kona thing, it doesn't require you haven't won the genetic lottery or anything like that. In 2013, Rob had surgery for a recurring back injury which left him sidelined for a while. With the bike shop taking over, getting back to Kona was put on hold for a few years. Last year, 2017, Rob attempted it again, but fell just short. Determined to try once again, Rob and Ashling set off for Ironman Texas with the hopes of finishing in the top seven in the age group and earning a Kona qualifying slot for the third time. There's, there's a few things that drive me. Number one, I like the training and I enjoy it. Um, but that's not enough because there's always going to be days when you're just fucking sick of it and you don't want to go out because it's lashing rain and it's cold and you have another six hour ride to do and you're no more in the mood for it. You want to sit down and eat cake and read a book. And I don't want to admit that to anyone. I don't want to stand up and say, I didn't do it because I quit. I don't. If I go to Texas in 
whatever it is now, five weeks, and qualify, that's great. If I go to Texas and don't qualify, that's okay. If I show up in Texas and feel like I haven't worked hard enough to qualify, that's not okay. Race start, it's quarter past six. Race starts at six forty, so just getting wetsuit on and gear ready and last few bits of preparation. Nerves are finally starting to kick in a little bit now. Texas was, uh, I suppose it was very mixed reaction to the race. Um, it's the fastest I've ever gone by about 20 minutes. Um, and the time that I finished in would have won the age group last year. Uh, it was a much faster day overall. We had really fast conditions. Um, so I knew even with an hour or two hours to go that the time that I was on for wouldn't necessarily win the age group. The The immediate plan was to, to go go again straight away. I tried to get into Ironman Lanzarote, which was four weeks later, but it was sold out. Couldn't get a slot. Um, for a number of reasons, I've decided to take a break for a couple of months. Um, in the run-up to Texas, I was probably as burnt out and tired as I have been that I can ever remember. I found the training really hard. The last two months was really, really difficult. Even just getting out the door on the bike or getting out the door for a run was really hard. Um, I was glad I got through it, but it took a lot of pushing from Ash and it took a lot of, there was a lot of sessions where I felt I was hanging on by my fingernails. Um, so I think to just go straight in again to another one, I think I'd find it physically and mentally very hard. Um, and there's some other things going on personally where we're looking at moving house and the business is crazy busy at the moment and it always is in the summer. So I'd be fighting against two big pulls on my time to try and fit in the training to try and qualify again. The Kona thing is still there, but I think recognising the level of commitment it requires, not just from me, but from anybody else, everyone else that's that's involved. I think I need to just take a break from it for a while. One of the things that keeps you going when it gets really, really hard and when it really starts to hurt, and it depends, it can start to hurt in the first 30 minutes on the bike if you're having a bad day. It mightn't hurt until the last hour of the run. But what keeps me going when the pain starts is knowing that other people have gotten me there. Ironman looks like a really individual sport, but it's not. It's, it's, you've got to, almost every one of us has a team of people behind us. I couldn't train like this without Ashling's support, without her coaching and her guidance, without the sacrifices she makes so that I can fit in another five hour bike ride and another two hour run or I can go to the pool again. So her life is impacted by it. And she puts a huge amount of work into making sure that I can do that. And when it reaches a certain point in training and racing, when you're not motivated to do it for yourself anymore, you're just fucking sick of it, or it hurts too much, it's much easier to back off if you're only racing for yourself or you're only training for yourself. So I'm not going to not train unless there's a very good reason to. 
because the reasons that I'm training aren't just that I go to Kona.